Deja Vu for me. I think I spoke at SNEA in Orlando about 10 years ago. So really? this would be a welcome back to me. Uh, I do not have the word IOP in my slides. <laughs> I wanted to pull it back and sort of add that in so I can look cool too, but it's not there. <laughs> we'll try to do without it. Anyway, uh, if you've been watching IPL by now, you guys probably know what phone pay is. I think we've been blasting it all over the media. So I think we are in a fintech space. And I will talk about how uh, computational storage is sort of the paradigm that we should be moving towards. I'll give you a quick run through of what PhonePay is in order to publicize my company. And then I'll go through computational storage. And then if I have time after that, I'll answer any questions. But these guys run a tight ship, so. All right, let's get started. Our vision when we first started the company was to be a transactional platform built on payments. So anytime you're thinking of opening your wallet, you should be thinking of opening your phone instead and transacting in digital currency. That was the goal, that was the vision that we started with. Where are we on the journey today, right? So we look at it primarily from a standpoint of customer and how they transcend on the digital journey. So the first category that we tackled was send money, right? Which is a primary use case for all P2P transactions. You're sending money, you're gifting, you're doing remittances, you're making group payments as you go out to eat, you want to share the food bill, stuff like that. Right? More interestingly, as you get into it later, we're talking about spending money. Like, how do you spend your money outside of person to person, right? So, you're looking at paying all your utility bills, your mobile recharge categories, offline merchants, online merchants, in app. That's a very special, near and dear to us, which is basically allowing you an entire ecosystem within an app. So if you were as old as me, which I doubt most of you are, but that's okay, right? Uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, your computer screen was cluttered with icons of different software that you had to use. If you fast forward to today, you have a browser and you have multiple tabs inside your browser. Things have moved on to cloud-based services, whether it's your office applications or your SAP applications, everything today works off of different tabs in your browser. That was our vision when we started our in-app categories, which is you don't have to leave the app to do something on which you're going to spend some kind of money. Let's make the experience pleasant. Let's give you some time back in your day so you can enjoy a little bit of your life outside of Bangalore traffic. Right? The next segment that we're focusing on this year is manage your money. So if you've been following the fourth pay journey, you will see things like gold. I mean, you can't be in India if you don't do gold. I mean, gold is a way of life. It's just ubiquitous. It's a gift. It's a currency. It's used in weddings. So gold is gold. There is nothing that comes close to it. I don't understand it. I like it. It's fine by me. Uh, we've just entered mutual funds and we do tech savers. But the way we enter things is obviously this is a data driven organization. So we enter it in a very small way. We gather all of the data. We analyze it. We see what the user wants. And then we go all out once we understand exactly what it is that we need to do. You'll see that team pull out everything that happens at phone day. Anyway, enough about that. Manage and grow sort of go together. Where are we today in the ecosystem? Right, so we have 100, oh, 
In terms of data, I actually wanted to talk about banking as a platform. I sort of skipped over it. I run our infrastructure, and it's my job to make sure that when you use the application that you get a pleasant experience. And the most confusing part for me was, I have the right infra, yet my user experience isn't as good as it needs to be. And I mean, we have data coming out of our ears. It's a matter of culling it to find the information that we need. And what I found out was that my transacting users are about 10 million, but people who log in to check their bank account balance is about 35 million. That led to the idea. So people found it more convenient to use the app to check their bank account balance than to actually go to the bank applications or the browser. So that led us to the idea of banking as a platform which will be launching sometime this year, where you'll actually be able to transact with your bank through the phone pay app. So we're working with a couple of vendors, a couple of banks actually, sorry, to use APIs where you can open a fixed deposit, open an account, download your statements. These are some of the use cases. So we hope that that helps people out in some fashion. Anyway, enough about that. So we are the second largest payments company within three years of launch. So we're kind of sort of proud of that. So we need to showcase that a little bit. We have 30 million active customers today. And we do about $80 billion worth of transaction if you annualize it. So I think those are some significant numbers for us. I don't know about you, but it's sort of impressive for me. Uh, I constantly say this statement, we are a three-year-old company trying to operate at the maturity level of a 10-year-old company. And there are lots of challenges, including data that goes along with that. As many of you are aware, we are a Flipkart-owned company, so it's sort of crucial that we mentioned that Flipkart today is less than 1% of our business. We do have online and offline presence all over India with merchants, with QR codes, and hopefully some of you are happy users of the product. These are the, one of the fastest growing merchant networks. These are some of the merchants that are in our ecosystem today, but we're not here to talk about that. What are some of the innovative examples? This sort of dovetails into the conversations as we enter into computational storage. So we support all payments instruments. It's not just UPI. You can use your credit cards, your debit card, your wallet. We were one of the first in the industry to offer you a what we call as wallet integrated with other providers. So we look at wallet as something that ties you in to a particular vendor, right? If you have a Airtel wallet, you can only transact on Airtel. If you have a Geo wallet, you can only transact on Geo. What we said was, that's not what the consumer wants. The consumer wants to be able to not be have 20 different wallets just so he can interact with 20 different applications. Let's open up the APIs where they can import that money into a single phone pay wallet and do what they normally do with their money. So that was sort of cool. And we also have partners that we work with who are now in our in-app categories. Some of these have been a great success. If you look at examples like Ola, where it's a lot easier to make your payment from within phone pay than to actually transact outside of phone pay. So the whole theme around phone pay was to make digital payments easy. Whatever it takes to help you make that decision to sort of move from a cash-centric society to a cashless society. A couple of other innovative examples that we talked about was, I already talked about the Ola case. The red bus, 10% of red bus bookings today happen through the phone pay platform. 
it's a significant number given that most people are used to operating in different modular silos of the apps that they use. And you will see more and more of these. This is something that I'm very passionate about is our mini app categories. And we're going to try and grow that out more and more to give consumer the choice of how they interact online, how they consume products, how they make their payments. Similarly with Go iVivo, we users can also use Go Cash on the phone play platform. Now these things may sound trivial as I say it in a sentence, but they're not easy because you're working with a merchant, an aggregator, a bank on the receiving side, on the sending side, and the end consumer. In any single transaction, there are five to six people involved. And all of this has to work cohesively to give you the experience that you desire and need. Gold, right? I mean, you can't be in India without talking about gold. Gold is a way of life. You can buy gold, sell gold, hoard gold, get it physically delivered, keep it on the digital, digital platform, sell it. I, I need to understand the fascination of gold, but it's awesome. Anyway, that's not what we hear about, so sorry about taking away five minutes to give you a little bit of uh, introduction on phone pay, but it's sort of exciting. So. Computational storage, why, what is it, and why we need it are the things we're going to talk about today. So if you are a geek like me, and you follow Moore's law, you will see that we've sort of ended the cycle of Moore's law. We're not doubling our CPU speed every year and a half, right? Given that, you will see companies that do GPUs and all perform well, because you need to Data, as we saw in the last two presentations, is just exploding. Right? It's coming out from your ears. Half the time, we have no clue what to do with that amount of data. So what is the logical step when it's the end of Moore's law? You're seeing people program towards FPGAs. You're seeing more and more use of GPUs. Most machine learning or AI systems today operate off of GPUs. If you've invested in NVIDIA, you already know you're making tons of money. There is a reason for that. The reason being, it's the end of Moore's law. Until some really sharp guy somewhere figures out how to solve that, we need to distribute the load off of the CPU onto other computational units. What did this mean to the networking world? I remember working on a 9600 baud modem, and I was the coolest kid in ninth grade when I did that. Today, people, my kids don't even understand the meaning of the word of the word modem. They're like, what the hell? I mean, 9600 baud, I can't even download a simple video on YouTube. They don't understand that word. Today, we are at 1 gig to the homes, 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig. I just saw a demo of 400 gigs. Right? We're talking about switches that will do 400 gigs between your edge spines and super spines if you are into the networking space. What does that transcend to? What does that mean for a network engineer? The evolution of smart NICs have come into the place. Right. So again, if you look at the theme, it's distributing out because the CPU a Linux CPU or a Windows CPU, how many packets per second can it process? When you're talking about a 100 gig card, right? Whether you are giving it directly a slice of your core or whether you are using other, just the CPU as it was designed to, where it's interrupt driven and it's, as soon as the packet arrives, it's giving it to the CPU to do something with it. It can not keep up. At most, a normal high-end CPU today can process a million to four million packets per second. Right? That's the PPS as in network engineers who geek out on it talk about. 
It's not enough. At 400 gig, you cannot do that, right? Again, Moore's law comes into play. So what do we do? We push some of the logic back down to the NICs themselves. Now the event of smart NICs have come up. What does smart NICs mean? Smart NICs mean you take a little bit of the CPU, you push it inside the NIC itself, and you can take small components and run it in there to sort of free up the CPU to what it cares and what it knows how to do best, right? So for example, you can push the VLAN if you're running a layer three fabric, you can push your OVX onto it. You can push your EVDP onto it. You can even push your firewall logic onto the NIC because it's a very small subset that needs to happen and it offloads from the CPU. What, is, what does that have to do with storage? Why is this guy standing on the podium and talking about anything but storage? Getting there. Right, so what is happening in the storage world? Right, I don't think you can read the number, or maybe you can. You're saying by 2025, we're looking at 175 zettabytes of data, right? What does that mean on the storage side? Even NVMe isn't fast enough, right? Because the CPU cannot crunch through, even whether it's a three gigahertz CPU or it will go higher over time. It's not going to keep up with that. You have to find that little secret sauce and able to push that out to the storage device itself, where it will perform that one thing a million times and free up the CPU so that it can concentrate on something else. Right? That's what computational storage is. That's what we're going to talk about. What is traditional infrastructure, right? I mean, traditional infrastructure, if you look at it, you have your NVMEs, but again, you're bound by your CPU. As you can see, you have your CPU lane, your DRAM, and you have your SSDs or NVMEs, right? Today, they are used sort of interchangeably, but your host CPU memory becomes the bottleneck. There is no parallelism. At most today, you can put four sockets in a two U server. It's not enough to drive 24 NVMEs that you can put on a two U server today, right? So what is the answer to this, right? How do you solve this problem? We talk about IoT, we talk about zettabytes of data. Well, if you can't crunch it, if you can't do something useful to it, then why have it, right? So, hence the evolution of computational storage. So what computational storage does is that it pushes some of the very concrete, well-defined assembly code, if you guys remember assembly code from those days. Very, very small subset of what a CPU can do. You push it down into the storage device and let it do it best. Now look what is happening. Instead of just a CPU, you are, the red lines became green. Because you have as many NVMEs as you put in a system, you got that much processing juice out of each of the NVMEs. Right? So they can now operate independently, parallelly, to help you solve the other massive deluge of data problems that you're facing. Standardization is in progress. What is the good news about it? It fits into your existing slots. Your two and a half inch slot where you put a regular NVMe, you can now put a computational NVMe and it just works. Some examples from the labs. This is all very much on the bleeding edge. So real world examples are very few and far in between. I have a few but you and we are toying with it right now, just on the cusp of making something useful out of this. Almost all of you know what GZ compression is. It's how you compress files. If you don't know that, you probably shouldn't be here. All right? So today, what happens? We are CPU bound. This is 
regardless of how your SSDs are growing, what is the maximum throughput you're getting out of it? It's flat line. Why is it flat line? If you go to the previous slide, it's because of those red lines going in and out of the CPU, right? And those among the geeks among us, these are the Kentenbury files, which is the famous uh, edu uh, in educational institutional problems when it comes to dealing with uh, how you compress files. There's some famous guy wrote this files which are compressible using different algorithms, and that's how you gauge how efficient your compression is. Look what happens when you run the same thing on computational NVM. There's no secret sauce in this. As the number of computational storage devices increase, as opposed to regular SSDs, the performance linearly shoots up. And it's not quite linear, but it's sort of linear. There's nothing magic in this. I'm not putting something out of my pocket doing some voodoo stuff. It's, it's, it's the machine doing its work, right? It's the ability to parallelize your work, which is what it's all about. Fuzzy text search. CPUs, GPUs are phenomenal at doing concretely well-defined tasks, right? But if you ask them to do bitwise manipulation, they falter. But if you ask him to do 2 plus 2, he can do it faster than anything in the world, right? So what does fuzzy logic mean? Like, if you make a mistake spending spelling the word Maharashtra, you forget the second H. That's where fuzzy logic comes into picture. If you're looking for Maharashtra, but you misspell it. Tools like a -grab, instead of regular grep, can help you find those things even with those mistakes. Those tools, CPU again suck at that. Because they are bitwise manipulation. They are not concrete, defined entities that can be broken down into assembly code. It's not 2 plus 2 or 2 multiplied by 2. Now it's outside of its comfort zone. What happens when you push that off? to its computational storage. Suddenly, now this is a much more linear graph. This is what you want to see. So as you can see, if you push the number of drives to 24, you're getting about 100x capacity in your search. Now, think of what it means in today's day and age, as your data is, the deluge of data is large, and your text, your search is getting more fuzzy. Right. As you have these mountains of data coming in, in order to find the jewel in the haystack, you have to do fuzzy searching. It's no longer just looking for the word bat in a file with a million words, right? These are some of the areas on which this applies. This is a very nascent market, but where can it apply in today's world? If things, these standards are evolving, they are now, Pasnia is actually working on a standard for this. In infrastructure, which is my passion, you can use it for compression, eraser coding. For those of you who are in the Hadoop world, now you know that with 3.1, it actually uses eraser coding. You can use it there. You can use it in security. You can use it in the authentication. Error checking, CRC, what happens in DIMS. Platform. Some of you are very passionate about your data platforms. You can use it there. I will have to show you examples of how this works in key value stores. And in applications. This is a little bit outside my comfort zone. So if you want to see me sweat, ask me questions on this area, which is AI, genomics, searching, a little too high. I'm not that smart. So you have your neural networks, you have your fuzzy search, filtering. These are all areas. Think of something where unburdening the CPU and having a parallel pipe helps you solve that problem. 
neural network is a classic example of that, right? It has to do an odd even thing a million times in order to work off of its training set and come up with an answer. This is where that helps you. Okay? Ideal targets, bitwise data comparison, that is the key. Whatever a CPU has a hard time doing, you will have better luck if you push it out and parallelize it in your computational storage devices. What are the different kinds of storage models that exist today in the computational storage device space? Right? The classic example, the very simple one, is that your data is read off of this. Obviously, if you understand how OSs work, it will go into the memory bank. From the memory, it will again go via the CPU to your computational storage, where this bitwise manipulation or the, the CPU of the storage will come into play. It will do its work in parallel via the CPU, go back to where it needs to go. Highly inefficient, but still better than doing all of it condensed in a CPU. Think of it as parallel, right? What is inline data path processing? The data starts in the RAM, but writes, and but the reads happen on your smart storage, right? So inlines it, meaning instead of reading the file first and then writing it to a new file, you're doing an inline zip of an existing file. That's where this comes in, your data path processing. Next one is, this is the most efficient one. Your data is on the computational storage and is being manipulated on, on the computational storage. That is your ideal sweet spot. That's where you want to be, right? Examples are database queries, fuzzy search patterns, a grab. You know, Fourier transforms, if you are the raw and you're looking at millions of phone calls and you want to analyze what happens over there, these are some of the examples for that. The key word over here is compute locally on each storage device, return only the results back to the CPU. If you understand that statement, you'll have this aha moment that, aha, it's no longer CPU bound, you are able to parallelize it. What are some of the benefits of this? It fits into your existing machine. That was the key factor for me, right? When you're growing your business 100% every four months, you cannot stop the pipeline. I cannot say I will buy this special voodoo machine that can take on a CSD. It fits in your regular machines. Whatever servers you are used to from any of the manufacturers, whether it's Dell, HP, Lenovo, you name it, if you have a two inch slot, two and a half inch slot, it fits into it. That was key for me, I don't know about you, but using with standard servers is super easy. It parallelizes your computation across multiple CSDs. Same hardware, regardless of model, you can, it's hot swappable, you can take it out, you can put it somewhere else. You know, it's, it's really nice to have these PhDs work in a lab and give you something, but if you cannot use it practically, it's almost worthless. Right? So the practical aspect of it is very useful. Um, these are obviously taken straight from the vendor, so even if half of it is true, it is still worth it. Right? Uh, for me, I use Aerospike, MySQL, and Hadoop, HBase. I do ZFS, but I don't use computational storage on ZFS yet. But these are all optimized to work on your CSDs. And some of these numbers are phenomenal, but they highly depend on you. You can't just put this in, sit back and say, let me see you work your magic. It doesn't work that way. You have to figure out what it is that you want to offload. If you have a pain point, you have to invest in solving that pain point. This is an example of Myrox, which is an engine on MySQL, which is what I use. And this is showing you what it is with and without computational storage. TPC, 
It is a very well-known industry benchmark for those who are into data processing. These are some of the numbers that you see. It's a simple box running a CentOS with a 100 gig database, right? And you can question me and say, why 100 gig? I can suck the whole thing in memory. The tests are specifically designed that you won't be able to do it in memory. They are read and writes. Up to 71% latency reduction in query time. Now my DBs are over a terabyte in size and I have about 250 of them. So these numbers make a significant impact on my operational ROIs. Breaking that up into what exactly is happening if you open up the kimono, you look, look at the CPU utilization as to how quickly it finishes versus the blue one that just keeps going on computational storage. My favorite is the reduced memory footprint. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This one is not possible to make up. I wouldn't stand up here and make this up. I make a lot of stuff up, but not this. Right? I mean, just look how beautifully it just eats a very little. There's a reason for that, right? The reason being, it's not CPU bound. The CPU was able to offload something so it can breathe while something else does the work, and now it's just collecting the data to present it to you. This is a SNEA sponsored event. This is highly being talked about. It's probably one of the most active standard that he's nodding his head, so it must be true, right? It is one of the most talked about standard right now. Hopefully it will get ratified this year, and you will see some standards coming out of this. This is it's not revolutionary. I would say it's more evolutionary. It's just the evolution of how things happen. You know, you make the CPU fast, then you find out it's not fast enough because other things got faster. Then you come up with other ways to do it. 10 years from now, this will all be dead because the CPU will be 10x faster and then we'll move on to some other problems to solve, right? But the interesting thing to look at here is the different flavors. You have your computational storage drive, you have your computational storage processor, which is actually the unit that sits inside the drive, the FPGA, because you need to have a standard around it. If you don't have a standard, it's very hard to use it at scale, right? You need to be able to have your Linuxes and your Windows be able to run on it smoothly, seamlessly, without problems. Because if you fail at that, then it becomes the 5% elitist who enjoy playing with toys that will use it. And what you want out of this, you want mass production. You want people to use it, not just the scientists sitting in a lab. CSA is basically putting multiple computational storage devices. It's nothing else. I don't know why it has to be a separate standard, but then I don't understand standards myself. Again, I think I talked about this. It's low latency. It sits into your existing infrastructure. You don't need to buy anything special. You don't need to do anything special. It just works. I use it so I know I can say it. Thank you. One minute to spare. Wow. Look like I put everyone to sleep. Any questions? It is in use at one place. Something similar or a product already has been developed using this almost like four years back, the company is based out of Seattle. Uh, they are using it to uh, archival and stuff. Is this an inspiration from that? Because they had used like drives, put in like ARM processors on the drives itself and doing all the CRCs and stuff so that they can build up a very cost effective uh, archival storage. It seems that I'm just seeing this after four, four years or so. That's a very good question. The question is that there was a company in Seattle that actually does some offloading onto their drive. Is this stemming from that? Is that the question? Probably, yes. 
The only difference being is that many companies, I'm sure more than that do it, but it's proprietary. If you want to make your systems faster, you will put some logic into your hard drive. They already have capacitors. And if you ever opened up a drive, when's it gone bad just to play with it? I have, I have no life, so I do stuff like that. You will see that there are different logics and IC circuits in there. But this one, the difference being it's open. It is for more, more mass adaption. Uh, one of the concerns is like they, they already have patents around it. I have no idea about that one. The que question is, are there patents around it? I mean, if Amazon can patent clicking a button, then I don't know. No. This was an ingenious idea by them because uh, they, they have a real balance between the storage, the compute, uh, and the amount of data that is being transferred. Like, since the processor is fit directly on the, uh, on the specific ARM processor fit on the drive itself, there's no data which is moving out. So that, that network latencies are completely removed. They're computing all the stuff on the drive itself. But they suddenly have uh, many, many patents around this. So I'm not sure if we have looked at it. I have no idea. Sure, thanks. So I have a question. So here. Ah. So we have already latest interconnect technologies like C6, CXL, ZenZ kind of thing, who are actually doing this compute, storage, networking, all together when we need something. So do you think that the interconnect standards are open today and then they bring new technology to the storage and networking? I think those questions are better asked to the people over here than to me. I'm not one of those people, but they should be. I think at the end of the day, what a consumer wants, I think, is what he'll get. Uh, Everybody heard the question, it's about are the interconnect standards open to accepting this kind of uh, technology and are they working towards its adoption? So is that, uh, okay. I believe the answer is yes, right? I mean, I know some of the vendors here, I, I use Mellanox and I know they are working towards some of these things, but as to specifically, like, will this work with InfiniBand? I mean, it's, why not? I mean, it's, it's sitting at a layer that is above the network, right? Whether your network is 10 gig, 25 gig, or InfiniBand, this is sitting directly on the PCI bus, so it's sort of decoupled. Thank you.